Hey, Facebook world and YouTube world and everything else. So, um, I'm just the raw, transparent girl that I am. So, um, so anyways, I just want to share with you guys how sometimes being in the prophetic is not fun. Okay. Um, people always say, gosh, I want this glorious calling. And I'm like, no, you don't. I remember, I remember the prophet who really mentored me. He said, Shelly, you're going to have a life of being misunderstood. A lot of times where people hate you for a long time and then they'll come back to and repent. They'll say, I'm sorry, I missed it. You were right. Um, you might be misunderstood for 5, 10, 15, 20 years. Um, you'll have a life of loneliness. <laughs> you'll have a life of where people, okay, sorry, it's a client. Um, you'll have a life of where people um, are your friends and suddenly turn on you. Uh, you. You have a life where people are loyal to you and then they turn on you in a hot second. Um, people manifest around you. It's all kinds of fun stuff. Plus, you get to live a life of pray praying and fasting. And we're not talking like just a fast for like a day. We're talking like 20, 30, 40 days of just water. And it's like, do you want that life? It's like, yeah, sign me up. But but if you're called in it, as I always say, it's like, so what's your options? <laughs> you can either obey the Lord and, and live or you can deny the call of God. So I think that's probably why. There's a scripture in the Bible that says, touch not mine anointed, neither do my prophets no harm. To the best of my knowledge, I've never seen it for apostles, for teachers, for preachers, you know, for shepherds, whatever you guys want to call them. In different translations, it says different, but the fivefold ministry. But it does say it about prophets. And I think, huh, this is pretty interesting about that. And I think one of the main reasons is because we get attacked so much. We get hit so hard with misunderstanding and confusion and just betrayal and um, disloyalty. And and then it's, it never fails though. 5, 10, 15, 20 years later, you know, they apologize. And I think the thing that hurts me so much is like when you're going through the betrayal, when you're going through the disloyalty, when you have people be your best friends or, you know, and then all of a sudden they flip a switch on you and you're like, where did that even come from? And, um... You suffer a lot of rejection. And I think that, that to me has been the hardest part. And then when they come full circle years later, it's like you have to practice a life of forgiveness because if you don't, um, so many prophets die from cancer. That's a real fact. And I think so many times it's because you gotta practice forgiving over and over and over again. And because you feel misunderstood so much, you feel like I'm just speaking till I'm blue in the face. You know what I mean? And then it ends up coming to pass, but it's, it's way after the fact to where the typical person in the prophetic is like, oh God, that was painful as heck. So I think that's why it says, don't do my prophets any harm because I think God wants us to be gracious to people in the prophetic because of that exact reason. Cause you don't know the kind of betrayal they've gone through. You don't know the kind of pain they've gone through because I'll tell you one thing, it's really, really, really hard to be a whistleblower. I, I can attest to that. It's very, very, very difficult because if you guys are watching my videos at all, you're gonna suddenly see that I'm like this, five-year-old child that wants to play and I just want to I want to play in the water and the ocean I want to go swim I want to go for a bike ride I want to make cookies I want to watch movies with my kids I just want to play and so the last thing I want to do is give a warning the last thing I want to do is be a whistleblower but when you're called with it you really don't have any other options and um, you can obey the voice of the Lord or you can be in rebellion and I choose to obey God. And uh, it's cost me a lot of friendships. But what's really weird is they always come full circle. I have one um, that I'm going to see here in the next couple weeks where they flat out came against me um, 13 years ago and two days ago they, they called me and said, we're so sorry it took us this long to actually repent to you. And, um, and I'm never like, oh yay, thank you for repenting to me. It's like it broke my heart that we didn't have 13 years together. So that's my perspective on it. I cannot tell you how many pastors have done that to me. And then later on, two years later, three years later, five years later, they come to me and say, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry I damaged you. I'm so sorry I hurt you. I'm so sorry I just didn't see it. I didn't see it yet. I didn't see it yet. So, you know, people think the whole prophetic thing is so glamorous. And I'm going to tell you one thing. Unless you're called in it, stay away from it because it's not fun. I'm just going to tell you it's not fun. Prophesying over people is a blast. And in churches, you know, you're called to bring edification, comfort and consolation so um that part i love and i dig because i love being able to call somebody out in a good way and be like god wants this for you and god wants that for you and no more this and no more that and you know calling out a job or calling out their name or calling out their address i mean to me it's fun and um it's a little bit entertaining for other people but 
it just said that prophecy is given to the unbeliever, not the believer, right? Because it's a sign and it makes you wonder, like, where in the world did they get that information from? Um, so, but when you give a warning, I have never known really of any prophet to give a warning publicly. And so how that rolls is that, um, you know, you call them up, you meet them privately, normally, you know, in their own house, or you meet them at a restaurant, or you meet them privately, and you talk to them, and you share with them gently, right, um, what we need to do. And it's going to still come out harsh, because nobody wants to get a rebuke, but, um, but again, we have to obey God. So to all the people who wonder, like, oh my gosh, if Shelly comes to my church, is she going to rebuke me in front of everybody? The answer is no. So my heart is to love you. My heart is to bring edification to you. My heart is to bring comfort to you. Now, if you take it the wrong way, uh, that's between you and the Lord. But that's not my heart. My heart's not, not like, oh, I'm going to go see you on Sunday. I'm going to bring the hammer down and, you know. Um, but, um, you know, in the prophetic, you do get a lot of words where you talk to them personally, privately. So I'm going to tell you a couple things I, I had on my Facebook post. Um, people always say Facebook is so evil. But I'm going to tell you one thing that um, sometimes it's used for good. I'll never forget when God told me to put my stuff on Facebook. And I'm like, Lord, does anything good come out of Facebook? Well, in this circumstance, one did not too long ago. Um, I shared a God story about how, you know, suicidal and, and not me. It was about somebody else and how God intervened and saved their life and everything. And I don't know why the Lord told me, but he said to put it on Facebook. And so um, I shared the story and this random person had a gun to their head. They were going to kill themselves. And their phone all of a sudden popped up and the phone popped up to my exact post. And when they read it, they instantly got set free and they decided not to blow their brains out. So in that particular day, in that particular time, God will use a Facebook post. Has nothing to do with Shelly, so I get no credit. I have none at all. My purpose in, in my life is to, if I can stop for the one, right? I have a tattoo on my body that says stop for the one. And if I can stop for the one, even in ignorance, because it's God, it's not me, right? That put that post on there that day. And then they went to go blow their brains out. They looked at their phone, which that was supernatural and, and found my post. And they just read it and instantly changed their mind. So in that instance, God saved their life. Okay. So sometimes God can use something like Facebook for the good. And I'm not a promoter of it, so don't get all up in my grill about that. But I want to give you guys another story that happened. And I don't know why I'm sharing this story, but it's going to touch somebody, hopefully. So um, it was back in my maybe 21, 22. And um, we were leading a Bible study, my ex-husband and I. And there was all these young people there. And um, I had a real heart for this one young guy. And not in a weird way, just, just a big sister way. And, um, and he was still dabbling in drugs. He was still dabbling a lot in drinking and he was saved, but like just barely giving his heart to Jesus. And so we kind of tagged him as like, we're mentoring him of sorts. And so one day, true story, I was minding my own business. I'm in the grocery store shopping and I heard his name and the Lord said, call him right now. And so I called him and he was silly enough to answer the phone. I'm gonna tell you why it was silly. So he picks up the phone. He's like, Hey Shelly, what's up? And I said, Hey, um, this is going to sound super graphic, but I see you having sex with a girl and God told me her name, which I won't say her name out loud, but I did to him. And he's like, Oh my gosh. And I'm like, if you, <laughs> if you have sex with her, like full sex with her, you're going to get her pregnant and, um, and you're going to end up marrying her out of guilt. And, um, you're going to have the worst 18 years of your life. And the minute he turns 18, which is going to be a boy, then you're going to, um, divorce her. And it's going to be the biggest mistake you've ever made. I'm like, so do me a favor and stop. And he was just like, love you, Shelly. Like, I think you're tripping, but yeah, you're right. And I'm with this girl and that's her name and da da da. And I go, by the way, put the Budweiser down. And he goes, he goes, I did have a Budweiser in my hand. Now you're tripping me out. And I said, I, I can see a vision of your room right now. And, um, I'm not trying to be all creepy or weird. I'm just telling you, God is trying to spare you for the next 18 years because you're going to have a loveless marriage, a lifeless marriage. It's going to be really gnarly and it's going to be like a prison cell. And God wants you to avoid that. So, you know, he, he, he knew all the other stuff was accurate, but he was like, she's off a rocker. And trust me, I don't want to know that kind of stuff. Like, I don't want to like, you know, know that kind of stuff. And so anyways, I got off the phone and I thought I was just super grieved in my spirit. And a few days later, he called me and he said, yeah, well, you know, we did have sex. And, and about a month later, he calls me and he goes, oh my gosh, she's pregnant. I go, what are you going to do? And he's like, well, I think the right thing to do would be to marry her. I'm like, okay. 
And so um, he's like, I, I remember your word, but like, this is playing out, but I hope to God you're wrong about the marriage. And I said, me too, me too. I just, I'm praying for the best for you. And you know, a word is a word is a word. So anyways, he ends up getting married to this gal who I had by name and he had 18 years of hell. And he said it was the worst 18 years of his life. The best thing that came out of it was the child. But he said on the kid's 18th birthday, he mentally checked out and he said about three days later, he filed for divorce. And he said it was, he goes, she never cheated on me. It was just like the most lifeless, worthless, loneliest marriage ever. And he goes, all I kept thinking about the whole time, the whole 18 years was, gosh, I wish I would have listened. And again, it has nothing to do with me personally. It has everything to do with God personally. And he was trying to avoid that. He, now you might say, gosh, well, he got a kid out of the deal. Yes, praise God. That's awesome. And God, the Lord knew before it all happened what he was going to do. But could, could it could have been avoided, right? And he could have had 18 years with the right person that God had for him. So anyways, um, I completely forgot about this person. Went on with my life, you know. And I always loved the human. And um, it was about... 10 years ago, I get a private message on Facebook and he's like, Hey Shelly, this is so-and-so. I'm like, Oh my gosh, how are you? And he told me the whole thing. And he goes, I really, really, really wish I would have listened to you 18 years before. And he goes, those were the worst 18 years of my life. And I said, well, it's, it's the Lord. It wasn't me. And he goes, but I will never make the mistake again of not listening to the Lord. And he goes, you know, some people have to pay a price tag to really learn their lesson. He goes, I had to pay 18 years of it. He goes, I didn't want to leave my kids until um, I got divorced. He goes, but looking back, he goes, I should have left a long time ago because now my son has huge, huge issues with uh, relationships and he's in counseling. He's, he's like totally shooken up. He's like, I don't want that. He goes, one thing I do know is I don't want that. And he goes, you know, I've had to repent to my son for staying in a loveless marriage. And he goes, um, he goes, sometimes Shelly, he goes, people always think it's better to stay. He goes, but then when you go out, what, go through what I went through, he goes, I realized, you know what? I should have never even married her. And so he has a good relationship with the son now, but he said it was some really rough waters because of the resentment the son had towards his father. Like if this is what marriage is about, I want nothing to do with it. So why am I telling you guys this story? This story, I honestly don't know. I haven't told that story for a long time, but I want to tell you not to have regrets. I want to tell you when the Lord hearkens to something, he tags you on something um, that you want to obey the first time. Now, is God gracious? Yes. Is he merciful? Yes. Um, did he still turn it around for good at the end? Well, he got an awesome son, right? But the sad thing is, is the only thing we have in this life is time. You know, money comes and goes, relationships come and go, you know, all of houses come and go. But the one thing that we have that's constant that every single human has in this world is time. And there's only 24 hours in the day. And you might say, gosh, I'm going to start serving God tomorrow. I'm going to start serving God next week. I'm going to start serving God next month. I'm not going to hearken to the warning or the voice of God now. My tell, But what I want to tell you is to not waste one hour. Don't waste one day. And I'm going to tell you why. Because about a year ago, I had a dream that my mom would rapidly decline in the month of March. When I told my brother, I told a couple close friends of mine, because in those things, I don't want to be right. But I got a call yesterday, and unfortunately, it's true. So right now, we're trying to figure out what to do. So to everybody out there that's just buying their time, I'm going to tell you, stop buying your time. And that's all we have is time. And when that person's gone or dead, I want you to look back and say, I have no regrets. I want you to look back and say, I did what I wanted to do when I felt prompted to do it. Oh, just like my friend, sorry. I'm sorry, but I'm not sorry. I'm just real. Um, you know, I want you, people always say, why did you spend so much time? Or why have you spent so many hours and days and months with your mom? Because God had always given me the heads up like five or six years ago. Like, you know, I'm on borrowed time with my mom. And just like when the Lord gave me a dream about my dad that he was gonna die that day. And he did. 
um, exact verbiage, exact word, the exact hospital. I mean, everything. I mean, down to the very sentence that the doctor said. And so, you know, at the time, my siblings were like, wow, okay, Shelly had a dream and this and this happened. So we know it's going to go down. And it did literally word by word. So he's gracious and kind to give us a heads up, but it still doesn't take the pain away. <clears throat> so what I want to tell you guys, I want to spur you on. I want to spur you and encourage you on to love well. I want to encourage you to do what you feel called to do the first time. Don't have regrets. The only thing that we have in this life is time. And so choose your time wisely. Turn off the TV. Turn off all of the junk. Quit getting on social media so many hours a day and just, and just choose to love the people that you want to love. Go to church, stay involved, stay plugged in. If you guys have a mama and she's alive, do me a favor today. Reach out to her and tell her how much you love her today. I wish my mama understood that. You know, reach out to your mom and say, I want to know every part of our legacy. I want to know every part of our family. I want to know everything. If you have a dad and he's alive, hug him. Tell him how much you love him because we are not guaranteed tomorrow. And so to all of you people who just bide your time, it's like, I want to tell you to embrace the hours. I want to tell you to embrace your minutes. I want to tell you to embrace your time and hang on to it with Jesus. Because you know what? Before you know it, we're 50. Before you know it, we're 65. And then you go, did I love well? Did I choose to be with the people that God told me to be with? Did I, did I love my parents well? Did I love my neighbors well? You know, did I serve God with my entire being? And that's the other thing too, is that this gentleman said the biggest regret that he had was staying in that marriage for 18 years is that she did not serve God well and that she held him back from really pursuing the Lord. And he had a whole lot of repenting to do because you know what? At the end of the day, our thing with life is we need to fulfill the call of God upon our life. What is the call of God upon your life? Are you called to be a prophet? Are you called to be an apostle? Are you, are you called to feed a flock? Are you called to teach? And, and you're held accountable to the Lord whether you obeyed your call or not. And so that was his biggest regret is I wasted 18 years of my life sitting in front of a TV, drinking beer, going to barbecues, and none of that's quote unquote bad, but it's just a waste of time. It's like God has given you gifts, right? He's given each of us talents. And if we use those talents, he's gonna give us more. But if we don't use those talents, then he's not gonna give us more. So I know it feels like I'm, you know, barking a little bit and I'm not trying to, I'm just being super honest and super real. And I was like, Lord Jesus, what do I, what do I say today? And here's my day today. Okay. So, you know, I have a lot going on, a lot of decisions I have to make in the next couple of months, but I'm telling you one thing, I throw everything into the Lord's hands. And then I say, God, help me to give, uh, help me to make wise decisions that are going to impact the world. Help me to love well and help me to obey you first and foremost. And to never forsake the prophetic because that's who God made me. That's how he wired me. You might be called as a pastor and your entire job is to love your sheep. Go love your sheep. Maybe you're called to be a teacher and teach a bunch of classes. Go teach your classes. Maybe you're called in the apostolic and you haven't quite moved in that gifting yet. I'm going to encourage you and spur you on to fulfill the call of God on your life as the apostle. Maybe you are working it out and you're working out the apostleship and you're doing an awesome job. Keep going. Keep going. There's a lot of rejection with apostles too. So statistically, they make a ton of money and they normally go broke two or three times and they got to get back up and get back up. They go through severe rejection as well. So every apostle out there listening to my voice, I love you. I'm rooting for you. I'm here for you. I will always encourage you to get back up. If you're called in the same field as me and the whole prophetic thing, I want to encourage you. That every time somebody rejects you, there's another person that's going to accept you. I'm going to tell you that every church that rejects you, whether they knowing or unknowingly do it, another church will accept you. I went and ministered last night and I had such a blast. And the person that was hosting it said, shall I do your thing? And I'm like, really do my thing? He goes, yes. And so he gave me free reign. Do you know how freeing that is for somebody to tell me that? When somebody says, do what God tells you to do. It basically stay in your lane. It's funny with that too, the Lord has a sense of humor. Last year I was struggling because I'm not that great of a teacher and I'm not that great of a preacher. But what I do love to do is I love to hug people and I do love to love people and I do love to encourage and prophesy over people. And I'm like, God, is that enough? 
Why do I have to go to all these churches and preach and then do that? Can't I just prophesy? Can I just stay in my lane and hug people? And then I get a phone call from a friend who ministers with me and she says, Hey, Shelly, I got a, I got a, um, I got a, I got a, ha a house I want to sell. And I said, what? And she goes, I need your help. And I said, what's the name of it? And she goes, you're not going to believe this. And I go, what? And she goes, it's called Shelly Lane. S-H-E-L-L-E-Y Lane. I go, huh, that's my name. She goes, I think God's given us a double message. We're going to sell the house for 2 million and you need to stay in your lane. And she goes, you know what? God is pleased with that. If you just want to stay in your lane, I go, I want to stay in my lane and excel in my lane. I don't want to be in anyone else's lane. That's like giving me a gun, which by the way, that's another story and telling me to go shoot it without ever practicing. And I, <laughs> I had a couple people reach out to me and say, Shelly, you're freaking me out girls. Like really, you're going to get a gun. I had a pretty disturbing, alarming thing happen a few days ago and about a week ago now. And, uh, and so I need to protect myself. That's about all I'm going to say about that. Um, and so I need to be aware and see, you know, who's in my surroundings. So, um, I'm going to be wise as a serpent and harmless as a dove. I'm going to do what I need to do in the natural to protect myself. And then I'm going to pray. So anyways, I know I shared a lot today. It's 20, almost 21 minutes, but, um, I just want to pray for you guys right now. Father God, in the name of Jesus, I just lift up every person who listens to my videos, God. And I just pray, Lord, that people wouldn't waste time. God, I pray that people would stay in their lane and people would not waste time and they would fulfill the call of God upon their life that they need to fulfill. God, I pray that there wouldn't be 18 years of wasted time. There wouldn't be warnings that people wouldn't heed to, God. I pray, Lord, that, um, that we would embrace and love people well. And God, I pray that you would help us to get engrafted into your word and to fulfill the call of God that you have for each one of us. And God, anybody who's struggling with people who are in the prophetic, Lord, I just pray for grace upon them, God. I pray, God, that they would understand our hearts, to know our hearts are pure. Lord, I just pray, Father God, that you would bless each person in the fivefold ministry, God. Bless your servants, bless your preachers, bless your teachers, bless your prophets, God. And Lord, as I face hard decisions about my mom, my Lord, I pray, God, you give me the wisdom to know what to do next and give me the science to know and how to proceed. And Lord, I just pray, God, that, um, that you would help people to just capture the day and serve you with all of their heart and lead masses to Jesus. Because without that, our call is not even, it's pointless. We are here to go out to all the world and preach the gospel to all men. But it's not just the fivefold, it's every single human being. So Lord, I just bless that. And I ask that you bless your people. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a good day.